But let's just continue with the first of the problems. Why is it that the electron doesn't spiral into the nucleus? We first need to remember that up until this point, people thought that radiation, such as light, and matter were two quite different things. Young had done an experiment many years previously called the double slit experiment. Light passing through a double slit will form an interference pattern on a screen. Rather like waves on a pond. If you throw two stones into a pond, it creates ripples. When the ripples meet, they interfere. It's called superposition. Basically what happens is that the crest of one wave meets the crest of another wave and produces a double-sized crest. Similarly, the trough of one wave meets the trough of another wave and produces a double trough. But when a crest and a trough meet, they essentially cancel one another out. And that's how you get an interference pattern. When the trough of one light wave meets the crest of another light wave, you get nothing, which is darkness. Now that can only happen with waves. You can't do that with matter, or so it was thought. Now the first problem that suggested this wasn't entirely right came about with the photoelectric effect. This was a phenomenon that was noticed, that if you shine light onto a metal, and you usually have to use something like ultraviolet light, you can get electrons to come off, but only if the frequency of the light is at a certain level. Anything below that frequency, and you don't get any electrons. And no one could explain why that was, until along came Albert Einstein. And he said that light, which we had always thought of as being waves, was in this sense made up of particles. And he called those particles photons. And he said that each photon has an energy. And the energy is equal to a thing called Planck's constant times the frequency of the light. So that if you like, each photon is a little packet of energy of HF. And what that packet of energy does is it comes into the atom, it hits the electron, transfers all its energy to the electron, and the electron with that energy can escape from the atom. But it can only escape if the energy value of HF is greater than the binding energy that is keeping the electron in the atom in the first place. That is sometimes called the work function. If the energy is lower than that, the electron can't escape. But if it's higher, then it can. So Einstein concluded that light, which we had always thought of as a wave, could also behave like a particle. Einstein was also, of course, responsible for the famous formula E equals mc squared. And I derived that in my video on special relativity. But you can use that formula, E equals mc squared, to derive another formula, like this. We know that momentum is mass times velocity. But light particles, that is photons, don't have any mass. So how can you work out their momentum? Well, let us assume for a moment that m equals e over c squared, using Einstein's formula. Then we could say that the momentum of a photon is the kind of mass equivalent, which is e divided by c squared, multiplied by its velocity, which of course is c. And that gives us a momentum of e over c. But we also know that E equals HF. That was what Einstein identified in the photoelectric effect. So coupling the two together, you get that P equals HF divided by C. But C over F is simply the wavelength. And so P equals H over lambda. The momentum of a photon is the Planck's constant divided by the wavelength of the light of which the photon is a part. So far, so good. Enter the scene a man by the name of de Broglie. 
And in 1921, he made the daring assumption that if light, which we always thought had been a wave, can sometimes behave like matter, could matter, which we'd always thought of as being matter, sometimes behave like a wave? And he took the formula that says that P equals H over lambda, and he simply reversed it to say that lambda equals H over P. And then he said, if you take electrons, the momentum of an electron is mv, mass times velocity. And therefore, the wavelength of an electron, lambda, no one had ever heard of such a thing, equals h divided by mv. For that, he got a PhD and a Nobel Prize. He was postulating that electrons behave like waves and have a wavelength lambda which is equal to h divided by mv. It was a few years later that two experimental physicists called Davison and Germer showed that this was right. They essentially repeated Young's double slit experiment, but using electrons instead of light. The slits were provided essentially by the gaps between atoms in a crystal. And when Davison and Germer fired electrons at the crystal, they observed an interference pattern, and de Broglie had been proved right. But there was an enormous consequence of this. Electrons are not only particles, they are also waves. And this might be the solution to the problem of how is it that electrons don't spiral into the nucleus. The man who now comes on the scene is a man by the name of Schrodinger. And he took forward the idea that an electron might be a wave rather than a particle. If an electron is a wave rather than a particle, then you have to describe it with wave formulae rather than the basic Newton mechanics, which is usually used to describe particles. And so he came up with the idea of describing the electron as a wave. And in another of my videos, you can look at the Schrodinger equation, both its derivation and its implication for a hydrogen atom. And what you will find is that when Schrodinger solves his equation, his wave equation, for a hydrogen atom, it requires the electron to occupy only certain energy levels. The electron cannot do what it likes. It cannot spiral into the centre of the nucleus because it is forced by virtue of the fact that it is a wave as well as a particle to occupy only certain energy levels. And that means it can't spiral into the nucleus. And so the fact that the electron behaves both as a wave and a particle is the reason why atoms do not annihilate and the reason why we are all still here.